When brake engineers start the work of sizing a new brake system in a car, the first thing they do is create something called the ideal brake curve. So, what is the ideal brake curve and what does it tell us? Hello everyone, I'm Hubert Mace and this is Suspensions Explained. The ideal brake curve is a graph brake engineers create before they know anything about the brake system of a new car. It is the first step in designing the new system. It shows us what the stopping power is of the front and rear axles under ideal conditions. In other words, if we had a perfect brake system, how much stopping power could we get from the front and rear axles? It does not tell us what the actual brake system can do. That comes later. It only tells us what the stopping power of the front and rear axles are. It is then up to the brake system engineer to design a brake system that makes the best use of that stopping power. The curve also tells us what the front and rear brake forces could be for different types of surfaces, such as ice, wet or dry pavement. Let's look at a typical ideal brake curve. I should preface this by saying that the units I'll be using are all metric. It's what I'm used to after spending 31 years in the auto industry, and it's what every car company has been using for the last three decades or more. The principles are what matter, and they don't care about the units. Here we see a typical ideal brake curve. The brake force on the front axle is along the horizontal axis, and the brake force of the rear axle is along the vertical axis. And these diagonal lines represent different types of surfaces. In particular, they represent the friction coefficient between our tires and those surfaces. So let's look at how to read this curve. The first thing we need to know is what type of surface we are on. Let's start with dry pavement, which we will assume has a friction coefficient of 1. Look for the diagonal line marked 1 and follow it until we reach the curve. From there, we can go down and read the front brake force, and we can go over and read the rear brake force. What this is saying is that on dry pavement, our vehicle with an ideal brake system could generate about 13,500 newtons of brake force on the front axle, and just under 6,000 newtons of brake force on the rear axle. Now let's see what happens if instead we assume that we're on ice. Ice has a friction coefficient of about 0.2, so let's find the line that says 0.2 and again follow it up until we reach our curve. From there, again, we can look at the front and rear brake forces. And in this case, the front brake force that we could ideally create or generate is a little over 2,000 newtons. And the rear brake force is a little under 2,000 newtons. And this makes sense because the surface is much more slippery, so we shouldn't be able to create as much braking force as you would on something like dry pavement. Notice how the line is curved. This is because the harder we brake, the more weight is transferred to the front axle. This means that as we brake harder and harder, the rear axle gets unloaded by the weight transfer and can't provide as much of the stopping power. Imagine if we were on a super sticky surface and we had super strong brakes. At some point, we will brake so hard that the rear wheels will lift off the ground. You can easily imagine this on a bicycle or on a motorcycle. At the point where the rear wheels lift off the ground, there is no more traction between those wheels. And so, of course, they cannot provide any stopping power at all. That will be the point at which this line has curved all the way around and come back down to the horizontal line. So let's look at what goes into developing this curve. What is it that we need to know about the car to create it? We actually only need to know four things about the car. The weight, the weight distribution, the center of gravity height above ground, and the wheelbase. The weight and weight distribution tells us how much force is on each axle to start with. And this tells us how much braking power we can get from the start. The height of the center of gravity, together with the wheelbase, tell us how much weight transfer there will be during braking. Let's look at what happens to the curve when you start playing with these numbers. 
Here we see the four parameters that we need to know in order to generate the ideal brake curve. Let's change the weight of the car from 2000 kilograms to 1500 kilograms. You can see the basic shape of the curve is the same. It just takes less force to stop the lighter car, which makes perfect sense. Here you see the heavier car and the lighter car again. You see how the brake force has been reduced based on the weight of the car. Now, what if we change the weight distribution? We had 50% front weight before. Let's change that to 60%. See how the shape of the curve has changed quite drastically. If we go back to the 50% weight distribution case, we see that on the surface with a friction coefficient of one, we could get almost 6,000 newtons of stopping power from the rear axle, and we only needed about 13,500 newtons from the front axle. If we now go back to the 60% weight distribution car, and look at the same friction coefficient line, we see that the rear axle can only give us 4,000 newtons of stopping power, and we need about 15,500 newtons from the front axle. This again makes perfect sense as well, since we have so much more weight sitting on the front wheels right from the start. We just can't get as much stopping power from the rear axle. We need to ask a lot more from the front. Let's go back to our 50% weight distribution car and now change the height of the center of gravity from 550 millimeters to 700 millimeters. We see how the curve has changed again. The higher center of gravity means there will be more weight transfer as we brake harder. So we lose stopping ability at the rear axle and need to get more power from the front axle. Look again at the case of a 550 millimeter high CG height and our 700 millimeter CG height. You can see the difference in the curves. The same goes for the wheelbase. Let's now reduce the wheelbase from 2800 millimeters to 2500 millimeters. Notice how the curve has changed again. Again, it makes perfect sense though. If we reduce the wheelbase, we will get more weight transfer going to the front axle, so we will reduce the stopping power from the rear axle and need to get more from the front axle. I should reiterate at this point that everything that we've talked about so far has absolutely nothing to do with the actual brakes that are going to be in the car. Remember, the ideal brake curve is generated before we know anything about the brake system. It hasn't been designed yet. We don't know how big the rotors are going to be. We don't know what type of calipers we're going to use. We don't know anything about the booster. None of those systems have been designed yet. So we know nothing about the actual brakes. Everything about the ideal brake curve strictly relates to how much braking force the front and rear axles could generate under ideal conditions, and if we had a brake system that could make use of all of that traction. The ideal brake curve talks only about the braking force that the traction on the front and rear axles could give us if we had a brake system that could make use of it. Let's look at some real vehicles and see how their ideal brake curves would compare. Let's use a 2022 Porsche 911 and a 2022 Honda Accord. We'll have to make some assumptions about the height of the center of gravity in these cars, but all the other parameters we need are published and easily available. Let's start with the Porsche. This vehicle is 1570 kilograms, has a front weight distribution of 39%, I'm assuming a CG height somewhere around 450 millimeters, and it has a wheelbase of 2450 millimeters. Here is the ideal brake curve for the 911. Notice how much more vertical it is than the curves we've had before. And this is because the car starts out with so much more rear weight that it takes a lot of weight transfer to unload the rears. We can get a lot of braking power out of the rear of this car because there's so much more weight sitting on it. Now let's look at the Honda. This car has a mass of 1,428 kilograms, a front weight of 60.3%, a CG height that I assume is probably somewhere around 550 millimeters, and it has a wheelbase of 2,830 millimeters. Look at this curve. It's much flatter, much more horizontal, because we need to get far more braking power out of those front wheels because there's so much more weight sitting on the front wheels. Also with the higher CG, we get more weight transfer happening during braking. So again, that's putting a larger and larger requirement on the front brakes. We need to ask those front brakes to do far more work than on the rears. Here again, look at the Porsche and the Honda. 
This also explains that when you look at the brakes in a Honda, you will see the rear brakes are much smaller than the front brakes, whereas in the Porsche, the rear brakes are as big, if not bigger, than the fronts. So now we know what the ideal brake curve is and what it tells us. Next time, we'll see how this curve helps us in designing a brake system. If you've enjoyed this video, please hit that like and subscribe button, and we'll see you next time for another Suspensions Explained.